Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome everyone to our Wednesday night Bible study here at Beverly Hills Baptist Church. If you're our guest, we thank you for tuning in. Tonight we pick up in John chapter 7, uh, continuing in verse 32. Now last week we looked at John chapter 7, uh, verses 25 through uh, 31, and we talked about the reason why we should be talking about Jesus. Now, just a few uh, chapters before that, or a few verses before that, at the beginning of verse 7, we talked about why the gospel doesn't flourish. And last week we picked up on why we should be talking about Jesus and how we can help the gospel to flourish. Now, if you remember from last week, we talked about how uh, Jesus comes before the uh, Jewish leaders and the people at the Feast of Booths, and people begin to ask, can this be the Christ? Uh, now we pick up in verse 32, and we're going to look at, uh, we only have a short time to talk about Jesus. And this is the reason why we should be talking about Jesus. Now, remember, we talked about Jesus is the Son of God, and Jesus still performs miracles today. We only have a short time to talk about Jesus. So picking up in John chapter 7, verse 32, the Pharisees heard the crowd muttering these things about him. Now, what was the crowd murmuring or muttering about him? They were talking about how uh, Jesus is going to come, and could Jesus be the Messiah? Some people in Jerusalem therefore said, Is not this man who we speak, uh, uh, they seek to kill? And here he is speaking openly, uh, and yet they say nothing. Uh, can it be that the authorities really know who this is? Do they really know that this is the Christ? Uh, but we know where this man's come from. When the Christ comes, we will not know where he comes from. So Jesus proclaimed, and he taught them in the temple, You know me, and you know where I come from. But I have not come of my own accord, but from him who sent me, who is true. Now, this is Jesus talking about the Father, that he is here to do the Father's will and that the Father sent him. And so they were seeking to arrest him, but no one laid a hand on him because his hour had not yet come. Yet many of the people believed. They believe in these sayings and these teachings and believe that he was the Messiah. So as the Pharisees hear the crowd muttering these things about him, the chief priests and Pharisees sent officers to arrest him. Now they're ready to arrest him and to take him because he has equated himself with God, saying that he is the Son of God. Now, understanding that Jesus is not the physical offspring of God, but that he is God himself working in a father-son relationship. But nonetheless, explaining that he is the Son of God and that he is God incarnate is blasphemous to them because they do not believe him to be the Messiah. Jesus then said, I will be with you for a little longer, and then I am going to him who sent me. You will seek me, and you will not find me. Where I am, you cannot come. So Jesus explains to the people, to his disciples, and to those who are listening, that he will be with them for just a little longer. Uh, the time has not yet come for him to be crucified. There will be a time when Jesus' earthly ministry is over, but at this moment it has not come. And when I am going, or where I'm going, I'm going to him who sent me. That means he is going back to the Father. And you will seek me, but you will not find me. And where I am, you cannot come. Now, he is not talking about the disciples. He is not talking about the, the believers. Who he is talking about, where I am, you cannot come, is he is speaking to the religious leaders and those who are unbelievers. There are things that uh, God, I don't want to say cannot do, because God can do anything he wants, but there are things that God will not do. And one of those things that God will not do is that God will not take an unbeliever to heaven. You must profess Jesus as Lord and Savior. Uh, and so uh, here, as we understand, Jesus is explaining to them that where he goes, the li religious leaders and the Pharisees, the Sadducees, they can't go. They cannot go there, and they cannot go because they are not believers. Uh, furthermore, that their heart is in the wrong place. And so therefore, they cannot go where Jesus is going. Uh, we have to understand that the reason why we need to be talking about Jesus, uh, as we see here, is that you will have me for a little longer, and then I will go, and where I go, you cannot come. We only have a limited amount of time to tell people about Jesus. Now, that might sound a little crazy, thinking that uh, if the average person, um, let's take me for instance, uh, I began preaching at the age of 15. I was saved at the age of 12. I began preaching at the age of 15. I can tell you that I have preached to thousands of people. Now, I haven't preached to a thousand people at one time. I've uh, never been in an auditorium and preached like that, but I've preached to hundreds of people at a time. And I know over the course of my lifetime, I will preach to thousands, if not tens of thousands, or hundreds of thousands of people. 
So the average pastor uh, doing that, you may think, well, he has plenty of time. I've been preaching for almost 25 years now as I started preaching at uh, 15. Uh, kind of let you know I'll be 39 this year if you do the math, right? But you think about it, uh, they, you say, well, we have plenty of time. Yes, you're right. But those that we preach to, those that we speak to, those that we go to reach, they may not have a lot of time. There's no telling how long the average unbeliever will have before something happens in their life and they can no longer hear the gospel. Now, you may say that the unbeliever can live a short life or a long life. Uh, life expectancy is uh, random and sporadic. The only thing certain in life is uh, taxes and death, they say. Well, I can tell you for sure that uh, the only thing certain in the spiritual life is uh, death, spiritual death. And so we may only have a limited time to reach someone uh, for the gospel. So it's why it's vitally important that we should be constantly telling others about Jesus. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that we just go around uh, preaching in Walmarts or uh, preaching in a workplace and just always telling people about Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. A lot of that has to do with the way you live your life. We call this, what I call this, relationship evangelism where you build a relationship, and then through building that relationship, you share the gospel. Uh, actions speak louder than words, and how people see you live your life will be a big impact to them on how they believe or how they accept the gospel. If you proclaim to be a Christian, but you live like the world, then the unbeliever sees no reason as to why they should accept Jesus, because they're living the same way you are. But if you live a different life, if you live a life set apart, this coming Sunday morning, we're going to take a look at what does a spirit-filled believer look like. If you live a life that is set apart from the world, people take note of that. And when they take note of that, they begin to see a difference. And that's what we need to do. Is we always need to be telling others about Jesus because we just don't know how long we have to be able to tell them. Now, this brings us to our last one. You can reach some people that others cannot. And this is a big part about why we need to talk about Jesus is that there may be someone you can reach for the gospel that I might not be able to reach for the gospel. Now, verse 35, the Jews said to one another, what does this man intend to do? Or what does this man intend to go? Well, we will not find him. They don't understand. As Jesus has explained to them that where I go, you cannot come. Now, he's talking in a spiritual manner of going to heaven to be with the Father. But the Jews seem to think that he's going to escape and go to another physical location. What does this man intend to do or to go there that we will not find him? Does he intend to go to the dispersion among the Greeks and teach to the Greeks? Now, this is very interesting. What you have to understand in Jewish history in this time is that Jesus was Jewish. The Pharisees and the Sadducees, the scribes, the Sanhedrin were Jewish. Uh, the Old Testament was written to the Jewish people. God has a particular reason as to why he has called and has spoken to the Jews first. But as we see in the book of Romans, to the Jew first and then to the Gentile. The dispersion, which is mentioned here, and uh, go to the Greeks and teach the Greeks, doesn't necessarily mean the Grecian people, but it means the Gentile people. Gentile means those who are not Jew. So what they're asking is, Jesus is saying he's going where we cannot go. Does he intend to go and preach among the Gentiles? Are we going to drive him out because we don't accept his message? So therefore, he is going to go and tell the Gentiles about it. Is he going to go reach those that no one else will? And so what you uh, have to understand in the Greeks and the Gentiles is that uh, where the Jewish center hub was in Jerusalem, all around the cities and the outlying countries, there were dispersions or groups of Gentile people that lived their life in and amongst and around the Jewish people. Uh, there were uh, many, many, many people. Uh, and in the world today, I would dare say there are more Gentile than Jewish people. Just because of the impact of how uh, the Gentile world has grown compared to the Jewish communities. Now, what they're saying is, is he going to go and is he going to go reach to the people that we won't go to? And that's specifically the point. Is that we need to be telling others about Jesus because there may be someone that you can reach that I cannot. When I was uh, getting ready to go off to Bible college, there was a group of bikers that came to my home church in North Carolina. And uh, some people in the church treated them rather harshly and others uh, accepting them with open arms, giving them the gospel and feeding them. We could tell that they were tired and they were weary. 
when the preaching service came, the pastor did something very different where he invited anyone in the congregation to come and preach. It was at that moment that the back doors burst open onto the church and these bikers walked in and walked and sat down in the front row. And a particular gray-haired, long-haired, hippie-looking guy got up and he began to preach the gospel. Let alone, did we know the pastor had set this up and that these people were, in fact, this gentleman, this long-haired hippie who rode a Harley Davidson, was on the board of trustees for Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary. And so he was a godly man, a Christian man, but he looked very different than anybody in that church that morning. And he would go on to say that he had used his appearance and yet he lived a very different lifestyle, though he looked like the world. He lived differently. He was able to reach others for the gospel. He was able to reach out to the other bikers and other communities and to simply tell them that Jesus loved them and he died for them. Now, there is a realm of where I am able to reach people. I have my effective range, but I have been in uh, communication and been around others who have a different range of people they can reach. And so that is why it is important that you as a believer, no matter where you are, no matter what you're doing, it is vitally important for you to be telling others about Jesus because you may be able to reach someone for the gospel that I am not able to. Uh, here, they, they don't understand, why is Jesus, is he going to teach the Greeks? Is he going to teach the Gentiles? God forbid, why would he do that? We rejected him, God rejected him, which is not true, but that's what the Pharisees thought. What does he mean by saying, you will seek me and you will not find me, and where I'm going, you cannot come. They were puzzled by this because they did not understand the spiritual implications of it. They were only limiting themselves in the physical realm, not reaching out in the spiritual. So what I have you to understand is that we need to continually be telling others about Jesus. And it doesn't have to be a direct method. It can be indirect method, especially through relationship evangelism. But there are more than one way to tell others about Jesus, not just verbally, but the way we live our lives and the way we treat others. Uh, that is a really, really big indicator of how we treat others, especially those who may be homeless, uh, those who may not have as much as we do, the less fortunate as we call them. That ends up showing a big difference in how we live our lives. That's what we're called to do, to live the spirit-filled Christian life and to reach others for the gospel. There are many other things that we can do. We must learn the Bible. We must learn to study God's Word. We must be true disciples. Um, but we also need to be reaching out, and we need to be telling others about Jesus. Let us close in a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you, uh, Father, for uh, reaching down and leading and guiding us and using us to reach others about Jesus. In the Scripture, we learn about to the different soils uh, the rocky ground, uh, the, the barren ground. And so, Father, we pray that you would use us to preach the gospel to those who will hear and who will accept. And, Father, to understand that it is all for your kingdom's work, for your honor and your glory. Father, we love you and we praise you. And until we see you face to face, we praise your name in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for tuning in with me tonight. If you do not have a church home, we would love for you to come and be a part of Beverly Hills family. We have a beautiful, wonderful, loving church, and I would uh, encourage you to come and give us a visit uh, and come and to uh, maybe join and join in our church. We have something really awesome coming up this Saturday, uh, the 18th. Uh, we are doing a church fun day starting at uh, 10 a.m. We're going to have Frisbee golf out on the course, out on the grounds. Uh, and we're excited to, to have a time of fellowship. We'll have hamburgers, hot dogs, and just a time of uh, coming and communing together in fellowship, which is very important. And if you would like to come out and just have a good time, we'd encourage you to do so. And then on that to follow on Sunday morning, come to church and come and see what we're about. We have Sunday school at 11 a.m. Excuse me, Sunday school at 10 a.m. and then preaching at 11. And we would love to come and have you be our guest. Until we see one another, I pray that the Lord will watch over you protect you, and keep you safe. God bless.